Who's ready for the Word of God this morning? Woohoo! Man, I love the Word of God, amen? I love the Word of God. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened to Patty and I. I like to watch sports, and a lot of times, and my wife doesn't particularly like this aspect, I turn up the volume on the television in the house so it actually feels like we're in the stadium. All right, so it's jacked up, and I'm cheering and yelling and, you know, acting like a coach and doing all this stuff. And so we're downstairs. We have a downstairs in the parsonage, which is right behind this wall. And we're downstairs, and I got the volume jacked up, and I'm all into it. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the game, with all this noise, I got the television on upstairs, too, but I have the volume off. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. That's Chad. I turn every light on. I want, you know, anyway, signs of life in our house. And so all this noise, racket, I'm cheering, the television's jacked up, and all of a sudden I hear this voice say, I'm going to tear your face off. Or something along that lines. It sounded like one of these dolls that come to life in a horror flick, talking over everything. I heard it over the television, the noise, everything. I'm going to claw your eyes out. I'm like, what is that? I said, Patty, did you hear that sound? What was that? Like this satanic Satan doll talking over my football game. Did you hear that? She goes, yeah, I heard it. I don't know what it was. So we're going up the stairs, and I'm letting her go first. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going into full kung fu. Like, yeah. like we're walking up the stairs, and she's going first. I'm like, what was that, man? I don't, what? I don't know what that was. We get upstairs. We look around. We find nothing. Nothing's on. The computer's not on. I'm like, what was that? We go back downstairs, and I'm going to claw your eyes out. <laughs> I start rebuking devils and demons and spirits, and like I'm just, <laughs> get out of my house, all this stuff. Like, what in the world is going on? So we go back upstairs, and all of a sudden, I'm in the hallway that goes down to our office, and Patty's phone had Bluetooth connected to our printer, and our printer has a speaker that's better than any kind of Bluetooth speaker that you have. It was bellowing through the house, this satanic Satan doll voice. I'm going to claw your eyes out. And so I thought, oh my gosh, it was just a speaker. I was walking in fear and trembling. And then it dawned on me, Patty, what are you listening to on your phone? <laughs> If it would have been kitten video, meow, or something, you'd be like, I'm going to claw your eyes out. Anyway, there's plenty in this world to make us walk in fear and intimidation. How many of you all know that? I mean, there, there are so many good reasons through the logical thought process to walk in fear and trepidation in this time to be intimidated by what's going on in our world. But I want to say to you this morning, for you, your individual life, okay, if you're going to fulfill what God wants you to do in 2022, you cannot allow fear and intimidation to rule over your life or to be your guidance, your guidance system in this year. How many of you all know what I'm talking about? If we're going to do what God wants us to do, we cannot listen to the voice of fear nor the voice of intimidation. So this morning, I'm going to go to Honestly, the against all odds, you're going to beat the giant story that we always refer to, and that is to David and Goliath. This legendary story that people even in the world are acquainted with. We're going to go to the story of David and Goliath. And I'm going to take three scenes from this awesome, incredible, legendary story, and I'm just going to give you three snippets, three scenes from this story, and take those principles from those stories and apply to this world, our lives in 2022. Who's ready? Amen. And so I want to start with this legendary story where Goliath strolls out on the battlefield and is speaking to the armies of Israel and to the Philistines and speaking and shouting to them certain weird words of fear and intimidation. So if you would, and you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 17, 8. 1 Samuel 17, 8. 
In verse 8 it says, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. That's, that's Goliath. For 40 days, the Bible tells us, he walked out on the battlefield and shouted intimidating things. Now, Goliath was a man, according to biblical, biblical scholars, he could have been anywhere from nine foot six to eight foot tall. He was measured by a cubit, which is the length from the tip of your fingers to your elbow, depending on the size, the average size of the person, which they were typically smaller than we are today, he could have been anywhere from eight feet to nine foot six. How many of you all know that would invoke some fear and intimidation? All the seasoned warriors, including Saul himself, the king, were cowering in fear after these 40 days of Goliath strolling out on the battlefield and shouting words of intimidation. I think there's a lot of voices in this day and age, in this season, a lot of voices. Some are out in the national media. Some are contrived in between the two ears on our head. It's inward. There's voices inside of us shouting at us. We can't do that. We can't do this. We shouldn't venture out to do that. We should not believe God for anything because the voices like Goliath's voice, are walking out on the battlefield of life and saying, you've got so much to fear and you've got so much to be intimidated about and so therefore you should not step out at all. And many times in our life, we have faith, listen to me, for emergencies. When we get caught in a bind or we get some kind of illness or we get some kind of strange financial struggle in our life, we step out in faith and say, God, please save me. Our faith gets engaged. But I want to encourage you this morning. There's another realm. There's another level that God is calling to us to in 2022. And that is for us to step out intentionally. As God says, this is the way I want you to walk in it. I want you to start believing me for things that you've never seen. I want you to intentionally walk out on the water. I'm calling you out to the battlefield to face some Goliaths. I believe that's another level of faith. And I believe that's where God is calling us today. Goliath strolled out on the battlefield and for 40 days, seasoned vets of warfare, people arrayed in battle armor, soldiers that have been trained all their life, the biggest and burliest and baddest men in Israel were cowering in fear in face of the voice that was arrayed on the other side of the valley, screaming out to them, you're going to die if you challenge me. So I want to look into these three scenes and draw some truth and principle from these three scenes that each one of us can take and put into our life, attached to our life and our circumstance and our situation. Again, who's ready? Say amen this morning. 1 Samuel 17, 22. David had been going out, all right, every day to deliver the happy meal, you know, the value meal to his brothers who were on the battlefield. And he walks up on this particular day and he's been listening to the giant intimidate the armies of God all this time. And 1 Samuel 17, 22, then David left, hear this, he left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran, mm -hmm, I love that, to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. Everyone hear me this morning. I believe that God is calling his people to travel light in these days. There's so much heaviness. There's so many things weighing us down. We have to intentionally decide to set our baggage down. God wants his body to be light, to not be strapped with unnecessary burdens. He wants us to be free of baggage so that when he calls us, we can do what he says. He doesn't want us strapped with debt. He doesn't want us strapped every single second of our life so that when he speaks to us, we have the freedom to be able to do the things that God is calling us to. We can't live to the very edge with our baggage and things that we have intentionally chose to strap our life with and think that God's going to whisper to us in the every moments of life because we're so bound up with what the life that we've built and the baggage that we have on our back that we can't even follow what God says in the everyday moments of life. So I believe that God is calling us to travel light in this day. And in order to do that, we got to do like David did and drop our baggage. David couldn't go to fight Goliath in the natural. He couldn't do it at all. But he couldn't go to fight Goliath with all that baggage on his back. 
He'd have no chance. And I believe God is calling some warriors today into kingdom battle. But we're going to have to set our baggage down. One of those things that I think we could label baggage, and this is what I feel like the Spirit of God has labeled or identified this morning, it's guilt. Guilt over things that we should have done, but we never did, and guilt over things that we shouldn't have done, that we decided to do. Can I tell you this morning, you'll never get far in the kingdom of things if you're burdened down and you have the baggage of guilt. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. It's time to lay the baggage down and allow God to move you around for you to be mobile and to travel light so that you can do exactly what God has you to do in this hour. I think a lot of people under the sound of my voice, and I said this in the first service, I'm gonna say it in the second service. You have guilt over how you raised your kids. I've talked to plenty of mamas. Man, I wouldn't have had them drinking Coke. I wouldn't have had them eating this way. I wouldn't have had, had them over at their friend's house. I wouldn't have let them go to that school. I hear a lot of mamas strapped down with guilt. But let me tell you something. No one's given a handbook on how to do this. Every child is different. No one has been a parent before they become a parent. That's obvious. Man, there's things that, you, that hit your life that you're not prepared for, that you have no handbook for, that nobody else can really fill in the script or fill in the blanks for you, and you have to do the best that you can do. And I believe that God wants to take baggage out of your life. He wants you to set that baggage down of what you should have done as a parent you got to lay it down right now, and you got to believe for a future that is God-ordained and God-perceived and God-created. you got to believe God's promises in this hour. Don't let this baggage, this guilt, listen to me, become your identity. Look, what you went through in your life, if somebody abused you or, or neglected you, it's part of your testimony, but it's not a part of your identity. You're a child of God, and if you, listen, if you know yourself by what you went through, that's not the right, that's not the right starting point. God wants to tell you who you are, and then all of your baggage and everything that you went through just becomes a part of your testimony. It doesn't become a part of you. What God wants you to be is left up to him. You gotta believe it. Don't let your baggage define who you are. I'm telling you, it doesn't identify you. You are a child of God. You're a son or, and daughter of God. Amen? Some of you could say I was abused. Somebody mistreated me. It's what someone has done to me. That's why I'm carrying this baggage around. But something we don't talk about enough is what people didn't do. I think it's something that is such a strong dynamic in northern New England that we need to talk about it. You didn't get enough affection. You didn't, didn't, you didn't get enough affirmation. You were not built up enough. No one spoke to your potential enough. Your father didn't show you affection. I believe it's, listen, I can say this. I've been here for 20 years. I'm a part of the equation. I believe the pandemic of all pandemics is the emotionally unattached father and husband. It's why our kids don't know who they are. Father, you are more responsible for what your kid thinks about themselves than any other person on this planet, and that includes mama. We all need mama's nurturing. How many of you all understand without that, I wouldn't, without mama, I wouldn't be who I am today? Come on. But the father has been given this unique role that he speaks into the identity of his child. And listen, you can say all the positive things about your daughter, your son, you want to, but if you never reach across the table to give them a hug and they never see your emotions engaged with them, listen, it's fallen on, on the ground. And so we can retire to our hobbies and our careers and sports or whatever we want to and have our kids be unemotionally affected by us. I believe that's a passive form of abuse. No, you didn't lock your child in a closet, but you weren't engaged with them enough, and now they're left wanting and wondering who they are. Is anybody out there this morning? I am here to tell you, it doesn't matter if mommy and daddy 
were lacking in some way, if they didn't give you what you need, or if you're a parent now and you didn't do your job, I just want you to know at some point, we got to close the door to the past. we got to take our, our baggage and set it down and say, listen, I, I was what I was, and it wasn't the greatest. I did my best, but I was lacking. I didn't have a playbook. Maybe I did my best with my heart and my life, but it wasn't enough, and now, God, i got to believe for a future for my children. i got to believe a future for my own life. I'm setting this baggage down, the thoughts of what I should have done and what I could have done, but I didn't things that I know I shouldn't have done, but I did. I'm laying the baggage down right here. God, help me. Move on in you. Press forward in you. Jesus, help me. You know, it's, it's really time for husbands, fathers, mothers, wives, individuals, that we become the David to our Goliath of baggage. For some things need to have their last battle. I'm not dealing with this thought pattern anymore. I'm laying it down and if it ever comes up in my mind, I'm gonna act like it's, an, it's the worst possible thing I could ever think. I'm never gonna let this thought pattern control one instance of my life ever again. I realize it's brought nothing but shame and guilt and condemnation and wreckage and residual damage. I'm laying the baggage down. You've heard the adage, leave your bags at the door, or leave your baggage at the door. That doesn't apply here. We need to leave our baggage at the altar this morning. You don't have to clean your life up before you get here. You don't have to release your baggage before you come in the door. There's an altar here. It represents what God wants to do in your life. It represents God's dealing in your life. I can tell you it may be a process of you laying down your baggage and setting your baggage down, but there's also these moments when God does it suddenly. When you lay your baggage down at the altar and he's like, boom, son, you're set free. It's over. It's a final battle. And for some of you men, it's today is the final battle for some baggage from old stinking thinking, old thought patterns that have messed you up, things that you thought were right and they ended up wrong. Anybody else has done that in their life besides the preacher? I thought I was in the right way and I was wrong the entire time. Man, I'm just taking the baggage and I'm leaving it at the altar and say, God, I don't want to be a bag lady or a bag man anymore. I'm laying this baggage down. God, thank you for helping me deal with it. Baggage from our past, baggage of abuse and neglect. Baggage from anything that's gonna slow us down. We lay it at this altar today. Leave the baggage at the altar, amen? amen. Look if you would at 1 Samuel 17, 28. Before I read this, I was the older brother this is speaking, the scripture is going to detail the account of the older brother speaking down to David, his younger brother. Now, I was raised in an ultra competitive family. Like, we competed about eating Doritos, we competed about trivial pursuit, we, anything, our Cheerios, eating our Cheerios, like it was, everything was a competition. And my mom, the sweetest of us all, was the fiercest competitor. All right, she was sweet, she's nice, but she would step on your throat in Jesus' name to beat you, all right? That's just the way, you know why I am like I am. So that's what she did, so that's my household. And dad was a Golden Gloves boxer, and so he taught Steve and I to box. Steve, we'll see this later. I, forgive me, brother, I love you, because I should have never done this to you. Talk about abuse. I beat him up, I beat him up, all the way through high school until I realized that after all those years, I never let them win once. There's no letting them win in boxing. Here, hit me, no, you don't, that's not what you do. I never let him win once and when he graduated from high school, we kinda got the same size and everything, then I realized I had trained somebody. And I was like, I'm done boxing you, buddy, because I beat you into the person you are and now I don't wanna fight you because you're stronger than me, I think. You know, He always feared me, but I think he could take me after that time. This is Eliab, he's the older brother. Maybe he's nicer than me, but in this particular scripture, he wasn't very nice to his younger brother. Let's read the story in verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. So David was actually going through the crowd and asking 
what would be done for the man that's, that slew Goliath? What's going to be done? What's the reward? I like this already. Like this little young kid, 15 years old, is moving amongst all these burly guys, these tough guys, these hardened veterans of warfare. And he's like, what's going to be done? What's going to be done? <laughs> I love this picture already. And when he spoke to the men, and Eli, Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? Like, hey, you got a small job on the backside of the desert. Why don't you go get back to it, and we'll, we'll keep at the important stuff. I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart. He insults the warrior in his brother. For you have come down in order to see the battle. Listen, when you try to do something for God, when you try to be the David to your Goliath, even if it's defeating your own demons, there's always, always going to be a naysayer. <laughs> there's always going to be somebody to tell you why it can't be done. There's always going to be somebody that would tell you the reasons why you shouldn't even start. Someone who doesn't see the world like you. Someone who doesn't believe like you do. I'd like to introduce you guys to Debbie Downer. Now, if your name's Debbie, this is no dictation on you. You're probably an uplifting person, okay? Debbie Downer always, always sees what's missing. She knows and will remind you of what you're lacking whenever you try to step out into a faith venture. She'll always remind you of why it can't be done. And she'll remind you of the worst possible outcome. I want to tell you something right now. When you're in the middle of stepping out in faith and your neck is on the line, whether it be dealing with your own personal demons or you're stepping out into some kind of great faith venture, listen, the last thing that I need to hear is the worst possible outcome. I'm stepping out in faith. So Debbie Downer, please don't tell me how the world will explode and we'll all die and there'll be a tsunami that'll wipe us all out if you try this. No, I am believing for that picture that God spoke into my head and the last thing I need to know is the worst outcome that could possibly happen. Is anybody out there? Say amen. amen. So you got Debbie Downer on one side and just to make it gender equal, we got Discourager Dan on the other side. Now if your name's Dan in the audience, please don't take it personal. Discourager Dan. He always has great timing. He always knows to show up in the toughest spot and say this. Did you really think this through? I walked out of my tent and God told me that the stars in the sky would outnumber, but that my descendants would outnumber the stars in the sky and I haven't even had a child yet. And I'm 25 years in and I have no baby and you're here to tell me if I thought it through. It has nothing to do with my thought pattern. God Almighty painted a picture in my head. I didn't, listen, I didn't get all the interim steps. Never once has God given me the interim steps when he painted a picture of a desired future to give me a promise. He never told me step A, B, C, D. He just said, this is what I'm going to do. And so discourager Dan walks up to Abraham and said, man, don't you think maybe you, maybe you need more concubines or whatever? And he messed it up trying to do it himself. Sarah, she's 100, she's 90 years old, man, get a grip. How many of you all know that all of us are part of the stars and the constellations that he saw at night? We are the children of Abraham. Please don't give me any narrative in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of belief about did I think this through? It has nothing to do with me. My mind couldn't contrive how I'm gonna get to my destination. That's where faith fills in the gap. Are you out there this morning? Right in the middle of the, of the struggle, the scourger Dan will walk up to you and he'll say, did you hear God? Reminds me of another story in the Bible where Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you hear God? Satan, get behind me. Like, please, like, 
the scourge of Dan, right in the middle of the struggle. He's not been fighting. He's not been praying. He's not been laboring. He, not, he didn't stick his neck out. Did you hear God? Stop it. The scourge of Dan will always show up in the middle of the struggle and help give a play-by-play -play commentary on what's happening in your life. <laughs> oh, I love that. Eliab was both a Debbie Downer and a discourager Dan, and he literally insults the warrior inside of his brother. He said, you're wicked, you're insolent, you came down here to watch the battle. But listen, that's where Debbie Downer and discourager Dan and Eliab get it all messed up. David didn't come down just to watch the battle. He wasn't overly obsessed with what was going on. He said, Eliab, get out of the way. I'm the David to my Goliath and my Goliath of haters. You that criticize what I'm doing and you that think you can run commentary and you've got your opinion on what I'm doing. I'm the David to my Goliath of haters. How many of y'all wanna be the David to your, your haters? To the my Goliath of haters. I wanna be that David. David says, get out of the way, Eliab. I didn't come to hear your opinion. I didn't hear, I'm not here to listen to critics. I'm not even gonna listen to the voice in between my two ears from my own brain. I came to fight the battle. I came not to watch. I'm here to see the giant go down. You can tell me what you believe. You can give your opinion. And listen, I'll listen to counsel and wise advice, but I didn't come here to talk. I came here to see the giant whipped. I came here to see the battle belongs to the Lord. And it's not me against the giant. I'm out of the equation. It's God, my faith, equals a dead giant with a headless giant sitting up in the open battlefield. I'm telling you this morning, I don't want to hear one more person's dictation on what someone should have done. I want to see people step out and slay the giants in their own personal life. Are you out there this morning? Do you want to be the David to the Goliath of your haters? I'm telling you, God is calling you to be the giant slayer in your life, to, to knock down those critics and those voices, even if they're coming from your own head, of the Goliath called haters. Man, I'm telling you, I believe there's some Davids in this house this morning, amen? Are you out there, Davids? She Davids, whatever we want to call you. Back up, Eliab. I didn't come here to talk about this. I came to fight. That's the type of guy I'll line up beside seven days a week. Someone who has a kingdom reality inside of them. They're not fighting worldly battles, materialistic battles. They're fighting kingdom battles. And they're saying, listen, get out of my way. I don't need a committee. God's calling me to do so. I will line up with this person seven days a week. They're facing against all odds. They're facing giants. And they say, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to button up my chin strap and I'm going to war today. Let's stop talking about it. Let's believe God. Let's believe God. Woo! David says, get out of my way. I'm going to go see what Daddy God's going to do today. Woo! Daddy God, what are we going to do today? What serpent are we going to put under our feet? What devil are we going to stomp on? Which way is the kingdom going to grow today? God, I want to be in it. I want to see you do this great thing through my life. Look, if you would, at 1 Samuel 17, 38 and 39. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head. And he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. David couldn't walk with Saul's armor. He couldn't walk in Saul's way the way that Saul did it. Listen, in life's battles, I can't strap on your armor and do it the way that you did it. Neither can you strap on my armor and do this thing called battling for the Lord and living for the Lord the way that I did it. Sure, we want wise counsel and we'll look for advice, but when it comes right down to it, we gotta stop judging people according to our armor and our battles because people do it all kinds of different ways. David, in this scenario, he said, you know what? 
I look like that I'm in a deficit against this giant because I'm not strapped up with armor. But in reality, and a lot of people don't know this, when the infantry would come totally arrayed in armor, the main offense against those that were in the infantry that were in total armor was the hurlers, the people that were light and mobile, which I think that the, that the Spirit of God is calling us to be this type of person where we're not strapped up to all this worldly stuff that we're kingdom, we're kingdom about the kingdom and, and we're hurlers and we're mobile and we can move and we can take down giants. He wasn't at a detriment, he wasn't at a deficit, he, was actually, he actually had an advantage, not strapping on somebody else's life and experience and trying to walk in another man's anointing and calling and the way that they see the world. I'm telling you, God has a battle for you to fight and you can't live it through me, you can't live it through mommy and daddy, you can't live it through some saint that you admire. You gotta walk your own steps, put on your own armor, be arrayed in your own arsenal the way that God has created you and don't compare yourself to other people because you can't do it the same way that they did it. I love Rick Warren. Now his church this morning on the West Coast, Saddleback Community Church would be done completely different than me. Matter of fact, this sermon probably wouldn't be something that, I don't know what they would think of it. The way he communicates, it's totally different. But I've learned something great from that man. I, I read his book, Purpose Driven Church. It changed everything about how I wanted to set up discipleship, how I wanted to set up a church. It is the guiding directive, the very purposes of God. If we'll do the purposes of God, God will bless it. This book changed my life. But guess what? I can't be Rick Warren. I learned some things for, from him, but I can't walk in his shoes. And guess what? He probably had nothing to do with this morning, you know, 15 inches of snow, 40 mile an hour winds, and, you know, negative seven when I got up this morning. He don't want nothing to do with this. He lives in California. He, can't, he couldn't take California armor and California arsenal and weaponry and come and try to do it here in New England. I'm just telling you, I can't wear his armor. I admire him. I look to him. He can't wear mine, and it's, same, it's the same as true for you doesn't matter if it's mommy or daddy or a mentor or somebody you look up to. You can't be them. You can't do it. You can't compare yourself. God has a battle for you to fight. He's got a battlefield for you to stroll out on and declare that the battle belongs to the Lord. And now it is up to you to walk into that thing, to walk into that destiny, to walk into that promise, to allow God to win your battles. It's time for you to strap on your own arsenal and go to war for kingdom initiatives, for what kingdom wants, for what kingdom is believing for. It's time for you to be the David, to your Goliath of doing it someone else's way. I think we all get caught up in that, but I want to say one more thing. You also can't excuse yourself because somebody else is doing it. You can't live vicariously through ministries or people. God is calling you to be the David, to the Goliath of the way someone else would do it. We can't be the David in your scenario. You've got to walk out on that battlefield strapped up with whatever God has given you, whatever gifts, talents, burdens, anointings. You have to walk out there with whatever God has equipped you with. Step right in the, the arena, in the middle of your life, and allow God to win the battle for you. Man, God will get so much glory. And it might be a small thing. It could be a large thing. It could be in between. It could be a whole host of things. But you've got to be the one to allow whatever God has given you to shine bright. And wherever you are weak, he can be strong. Amen. Amen. Come on, worship team. Come to the stage this morning. I believe that we can be the, the David to our Goliath of baggage. I believe this morning that people are going to set their baggage down. They're going to set it down at the altar, even though they may not walk down to this physical location. I believe that people are going to drop the baggage at the altar. I believe almost all of us have to deal with haters. I want to be the David to my Goliath of haters, the things inside of my head. So many times it's not what people say, it's what I think about what they say. It's not about what's going on, it's about what I think about what's going on. It's not about this person or that person or what they said or they didn't say or anything, it's about what I think. How many of y'all know that's true? 
So I need to be the David to my Goliath of the way I think about stuff, the haters, the voices that are pulling me away from being courageous and entering into the battle. Then finally, I need to be the David to my Goliath of doing it someone else's way. Come on, church, stand to your feet this morning. This morning, if you're on an all-out mission in your life, your, your life directional arrow, the motivational engine of your life, your will and your determination in your life are pointed one way, and that is the kingdom. It's about seeing God win in another person's life. It's about seeing God win in your family. It's about seeing God win in your church, in your workplace, in the school, wherever. It's about God winning of everything in your life, the directional arrow, the motivational arrow. Your determination is all about getting out to that battlefield and allowing God to use you so people could say over your life, the battle belongs to the Lord in my life, in Ben's life, in Patty's life, in Ellen's life, in Lisa's life, in Brian's life. It's the battle belongs to the Lord and I put myself right in the middle of the crosshairs of what is possible and what is impossible. And I stand right in the middle of that valley, just like the giant did. And I say, the battle belongs to the Lord. Giant, you're coming down. Giant, you're gonna, if that's you, I want you to throw your hands towards heaven. You wanna be the David. You wanna be the reason why the giant falls. You wanna put your neck out there and allow God to show up big in your life. Come on, hallelujah. Throw those hands, throw them up high to heaven boldly. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, the worship team is gonna sing this over you.